All right, welcome back. I'm going to talk about managing wildlife and working landscapes uh, this lecture, and hopefully you've already watched the island biogeography and habitat lecture and uh, understand some of those principles and why they apply to managing wildlife in a working landscape uh, uh, setting. So what do I mean by working landscapes? Essentially, uh, what I'm talking about is when we are using the land for some production purpose. That's in general what I mean, but it works more widely than that. And you know, if you just think about human influence on the landscape, but particularly land uses like agriculture, and uh, I mean, that would be the, the major thing if we're using it to produce some product for, for humans, uh, that is what I'm talking about primarily when I'm talking about working landscape. So we're working the land to produce something for humans. So <clears throat> I know uh, David talked a little bit about virgin forest in his lecture, and I wanted to come back to that. Uh, notice there's very little virgin forest left in the U.S., and a lot of that was because of land clearing. And uh, we cleared the land primarily for agricultural purposes in most cases. <clears throat> and uh, we've come up with all these really unusual landscape contexts now. So what I mean by that is what you're looking at right here is, is a central pivot agriculture. And basically we have in the center of uh, each of these circles, there's an, a source of irrigation and we basically are using that as a pivot point to water all of the uh, all of this area or irrigate it for crops. And when you do that across the entire landscape, go look at a Google Maps image of Southwest Georgia. It looks like this over the, a large portion of the area. It's just incredible to look at. I mean, an enormous area. And basically what happens in this is you end up with these little corner pieces that that, that uh, aren't easily accessible from an agricultural standpoint. So we end up with all these little weird shaped triangular or, or diamond shaped, depending on uh, how many center pivots are around. Uh, you know, we end up with all these little triangular or diamond shaped patches in that landscape. So really unnatural configuration of habitat, right? So what I'm talking about when I'm saying habitat is I'm talking about that plant community that's still intact that some wildlife species are using as habitat. Most of them cannot use the agriculture, maybe for the food component, but otherwise can't use that for habitat very much. So here's an, another location in the Mississippi River alluvial valley. So you can see the Mississippi River coming down through here. Notice before 1600, that was all bottomland hardwood forest. Now, the, it, it's, uh, it's probably very similar to this now, even 30 years after uh, what, what cu was current when this picture was done. But uh, notice it's all white. It was all cleared for agriculture. And when you, this is an actual Google Earth image from that area. It's somewhere uh, down in this area. What we've done in that landscape is basically cleared all for agriculture and then places like this right here and these, they're essentially wetlands. So they're too wet to, to use agriculture. So we have these little forested patches in the landscape and the, basically the only ones that remain are either too wet to plant or they had been cleared and now they've been re-enrolled back into a comp, the uh, wetlands reserve program. So uh, this is something that, that has been super impactful. And I think I've mentioned the farm bill uh, up in the first, one of the first few lectures. The farm bill is uh, from a conservation standpoint, one of the, the biggest legislative uh, things that happened for conservation, especially in these landscapes have been highly altered and basically what the conserv the uh, farm bill did was set aside some funding to pay landowners to retire their land and what I mean by retire is basically if if they're producing agriculture they can get an incentive from the government to 
let's just say this patch right here, maybe it was farmable, but that landowner's taken a loss now to not farm it and let it establish back in a natural community or even go in, you know, even more money if they go in and try to plant stuff to restore that. So rather than that landowner having to take a cost on it, this program provides an incentive and, and it's a really diverse program. I mean, food stamps are in it, all kinds of things are in it. It's this really diverse program, but one part of it is for conservation uh, in agricultural landscapes. And we use that to enroll landowners part of their property, especially places uh, that, that are really good wetlands or uh, in this system or uh, that aren't for some reason very productive from an agricultural standpoint. We pay that landowner to retire it from agriculture and either let it establish or uh, we go in and plant thing, natural plants to try to regenerate that community. Okay, so what you're looking at in this landscape is one of two things. It's either it's so, it's so wet that they couldn't plant it or it's being restored and it's part of the wetlands reserve program uh, there, there might be a, a couple of other programs like the conservation reserve program and used in this landscape. But uh, in this one in particular, where we're in an alluvial valley of a river uh, and, and most of the conservation benefit that we're trying to get is from wetlands, most of that is enrolled in the wetlands reserve program. So in reference to island biogeography, think about this landscape. We have, and you know, by, uh, creating essentially a sea of agriculture that at best uh, for most species provides the food component of habitat and not the other components. Remember, if you don't have all four components, that means that uh, it's not habitat, right? So most of this landscape is not inhabitable by most wildlife species uh, without having some other type of plant community. So from an island biogeography standpoint, we've created an island system where we have these little island patches that are highly different from the surrounding landscape. And that's what we're talking about when we say island. The island is a discrete unit of, of a patch that is distinctly very different from its surroundings. And these certainly fit that bill. Think about the scale at which we are doing this on the landscape, right? Like what, 50% of our landscape in the US is agriculture. So, you know, a large, this is having a huge impact on the available habitat for wildlife and it's not going away. We, we're gonna have to feed people, right? Unless people go away, agriculture is not going anywhere. So we have to figure out ways to manage wildlife in these landscapes if we want to conserve them. So, when we're thinking about it from an island biogeography context, this is a study that actually one of my graduate students did. Uh, remember, uh, it would be kind of this hump shaped curve that's, uh, but we have taken the log of this relationship so that we can uh, flatten it out so we can see it as a straight line. But basically what you're looking at is the species that we captured on camera traps versus the size of the patch. And that was done in the Mississippi alluvial valley where we were just looking at a picture of. So what I'm telling you here is the number of wildlife species colonizing the patches of forest within that agricultural landscape conform to island biogeography theory, just like anywhere else. I, to me, I kind of felt like that wasn't going to happen for some reason. I just didn't believe it. You know, as I just showed you in that last lecture, all these different examples of all these places with all these species where that happened. And for some reason, I just still felt like it isn't going to, it isn't going to happen this time. And I don't know, I, I kind of feel silly now, but when we did this study, we looked at like uh, 50 patches or something over a couple of years. And it just was shocking to me that not only did it conform, it conformed really, really well. So uh, for those of you who are, who have been through some stats, you'll, you'll know that this R squared essentially means how well does patch size explain the number of species present and 0.92 means that there's, that patch size is explaining 92% of the variation in the number of species we observe. So in other words, the patch size in that system is 
explaining the distribution of wildlife almost completely, which was incredible to think about uh, in that system. So uh, thinking about other parts of the world, the same thing is occurring all over the place. So here's just some examples of old growth forest in Costa Rica. <clears throat> uh, we can look at any continent where humans are, are a part of it, and we've essentially got the same sort of thing. But uh, some things I wanted you to think about. I don't want you to think about that Allen biogeography just works perfectly in this system. There are some really important factors that play in that change the relationship of species with habitat patches, and, th and they're pretty important to think about. So uh, two really important things happen with habitat islands, and one of them is habitat diversity actually seems to be more important, or at least it's magnified uh, in habitat islands in a like an agricultural landscape like I just showed you in comparison to islands in the ocean. And uh, the habitat diversity is basically what I'm talking about is within the patch, how many different types of plant communities are there? How many plant, how many vegetation types are making up the patch area? And uh, the more diverse that is within the patch, the higher the diversity of wildlife species in general. Uh, now you can get to this diminishing return where things get so diverse that there's not enough of anything. And that's a different kind of problem that, that uh, we'll talk about later on. But uh, in general, as you increase the diversity of a patch, the species richness of that patch increases. And that occurs in habitat like islands in the ocean or in islands of vegetation within an agricultural matrix. So either way, that, that same thing happens. It just tends to have a bigger effect on land. So I just showed you the stuff from the Mississippi alluvial valley. Remember that those forest patches were all bottom and hardwood forest. The entire patch was. So it we were able to see the effect of area very clearly in that particular system because the diversity was similar across all the patches. It was always relatively low in terms of the number of vegetation patches, but that's not always the case. So here's a, a really cool study that was uh, looking in uh, uh, habitat patches for bird species and looking at the diversity. So the problem with this is the bigger the patch gets, normally the more diverse the habitat assemblage is in it. So the vegetation types making up a patch tend to become more diverse. So the habitat diversity and uh, patch size is positively correlated and it's hard for us to detangle which one is uh, more affecting bird species in that case. But uh, several studies have shown that habitat diversity has this really strong relationship that you see here. Remember 95% of the variation is being explained by habitat diversity. And I think in that same study, habitat area was uh, explaining in the 80, somewhere in the 80s percent of it. So the habitat diversity was a better explanation than uh, the area in that case. So that's, that's pretty important for us to understand, right? So uh, you know, having a big, big enough patch so that we have, uh, that we have enough habitat is one thing, but the more diverse that that, that patch is also is a pretty important consideration, especially on land when we're thinking about fragmentation. Another thing, uh, that is very different in a habitat island on the mainland is we have this edge effect from all these different species, right? So think about it this way. If we're on an island in the ocean, most of the inhabitants of that island cannot use the surrounding ocean at all, right? Some of the birds maybe can, but uh, you know, most of the species on that island, it is a hard boundary right? That ocean is completely unusable. If we go into a habitat island in agriculture, a lot of species might be able to use the agriculture just fine. Like uh, wild pigs and deer, for instance, they do just fine using the agriculture as the food habitat component and then using the forest patches as uh, other components of habitat 
And essentially what's happened now is for those species, the effective island size is much bigger for them. Right. So we have we might have a patch of forest that's 100 acres, but the deer might also be using the surrounding agriculture, which now makes that habitat patch much bigger for the deer than it would be for something like an oven bird that doesn't get any benefit. It's essentially a hard edge that agriculture for that species. So that starts making this edge effect thing important. And a lot of our predators of many of the prey species uh, can, can basically be at a higher abundance in the patch than the internal uh, species would be, right? So like that oven bird, it's really constricted to this small patch, but some of its predators might be able to use the surrounding landscape and they get, they're at a higher abundance because of that. Their effective patch size is larger. And then you have more predation on those bird species like the oven bird that can't, that have that hard edge. So uh, the same thing could happen with competition, right? If you have uh, two mammal species and one of them, they, they overlap a lot in what they eat within the forest patch, but one of them can be subsidized by agriculture, then it increases its competitive advantage over the one that ha has the hard edge. And th those changes in uh, competition, it's often because one's a generalist and one's a specialist, but that those changes in predation and competition can affect the species richness relationship with area. And uh, they tend to be, that tends to be magnified in mainland where, uh, you know, the, the matrix around the island is not necessarily unusable for all of the species in the island. So another really important thing uh, for you to understand is that a lot of our conservation efforts in these systems are actually based on island biogeography theory and sometimes unwittingly. And what I mean by that is we have legislation for the farm bill that kind of leads it into using principles of island biogeography theory, but nowhere in that entire 7,000 page document or whatever it is, will it ever mention island biogeography theory, right? So uh, we, we in many cases are using principles because they just, they're obvious in many cases, right? Uh, and we use those to design conservation buffers and don't even realize we're doing it. So another thing, uh, yeah, so I'm kind of listing different things that we do with conservation buffers. And what I'm talking about with a conservation buffer, a lot of the farm bill programs are designed specifically to protect water. So you notice this waterway here. It's not just that the uh, that it's too wet for agriculture. A lot of these are actually buffers that the landowner has in, gotten an incentive from the farm bill, a farm bill program to stop using agriculture in that. And we, target areas along the field edge, especially when there's water at the field edge, because we're trying to, to slow down erosion, slow, uh, catch nutrients from the agriculture, and uh, protect that waterway from those, those different things. And by the way, uh, you know, this is the, the idea behind the Farm Bill program is that these are ecosystem services producing clean water and keeping our water clean, uh, producing or keeping the soil intact and l nutrients from leaching and all those sorts of things are thought of as the common good, right? They're ecosystem services that we're using practices to try to enhance. And we don't want to do that at the loss of an individual. That's supposed to be something for the good of society, right? So that's where the incentive comes in to try to offset that cost for the individual who owns the land to do something that's for the better, the greater good of the community, right? So that's one that that uh, that's how that works, and that is contentious. And uh, we, I'm happy to discuss that with you because a lot of people don't feel like they're getting anything out of their tax-paying dollars going to those efforts. And in a lot of places in the world, this kind of stuff doesn't fly because uh, uh, it's a contentious issue. In other places, uh, it actually is much easier 
to to get people in fact you don't even have to incentivize the landowners in some places uh, i know i've talked to some people from south africa where landowners often do things like this because they just want to do the right thing and uh you know it's just part of the culture to do things like that it's much less so in the u.s we have to incentivize landowners generally to do things like this so uh, when we're putting in these types of conservation buffers, these are a lot of things that, that uh, we often do. We try to make them as, as wide as possible. If you have a really narrow one, for instance, that makes it uh, that edge effect that we were talking about, especially from predators, much more problematic. So having a little bit wider area is pretty important. Another thing that's you know, obviously we've talked about the, uh, the large and small, but we also change the, the, uh, we try to strategically, uh, uh, assign the matrix of, of habitat. So in other words, uh, one big block is better than a whole bunch of small ones. Uh, one big block that has a smaller amount of edge per area. So like this relationship is, is generally better arranging uh, patches so that there's a shorter distance between patches if they're all the same size is generally better. So like that's what we're looking at here. And then if we connect these areas, that would be called a corridor. So we're basically talking about connecting two uh, patch areas that could be used as habitat. Essentially, that that's better than not having them connected. And think about what we're doing. We're essentially reducing resistance to uh, of animals to travel between them so we're relaxing the uh that distance effect by making it easier to traverse between the two and that has that positive effect go back to the island biogeography and think about immigration and extinction processes in that system and uh if we make it easier to immigrate that generally uh can overcome or at least dampen the extinction process remember so pretty important. There are all kinds of benefits uh, to thinking about this stuff in these ways. And uh, like I was saying, we actually do things like this all the time. So this is a, another uh, Mississippi Alluvial Valley picture from 96. And what I wanted to show you is how this kind of naturally happens. So uh, in terms of way that, the way that the Farm Bill program is set up. So this landowner donated all these green blocks here that you're seeing, donated that land to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they basically protected it, right? They took it out of agriculture and started restoring it as wetlands. And uh, that, you know, basically taking that out, that gave it a lot of conservation value. And basically what happened is you notice all these landowners that are around that in 96 didn't have much conservation on the ground but what happened is as soon as they were close to another protected area all the landowner the value in terms of the ratings for how they get rated to get a conservation incentive so they have to apply for that and they get ranked landowners get ranked and only a small number of them get selected each year well as soon as they were near a big conservation area that increased the value of that and what happened is a bunch of them got to enroll so now you can see that same green all of a sudden all of these other patches started to to aggregate of protected areas right there and uh then we go to 2015 and we're seeing even more of them. So we started with this small thing and then clusters started building out from that, which was, you know, just a pretty cool example of how that system really naturally kind of plays on island biogeography. Exactly what we would have wanted to do from an island biogeography standpoint is reduce distance between a patch and its mainland, which in this case, we're just calling this the mainland. Uh, reduce that distance between it, make it easy to, uh, to traverse, and then grow the area of a patch. And we're doing all of those things at the same time, even though that wasn't, that's not even the reason it was set up that way. It, you know, they weren't thinking about online biogeography necessarily. Uh, 
uh, when they were doing that. But I think this is a, something important for you to consider. You know, a lot of you are learning about different theory like that, and it doesn't seem to have an application, but all of the the things that we're doing in nature have ecological theory behind it that's very important for us to understand because it is forming the basis of how we decide to apply things in nature, right? When we're, when we're doing conservation, we're using theory, whether we acknowledge that theory or not, uh, it would probably be better if we acknowledged it more often. So it's important for you to understand that theory uh, when you're going out and trying to, to get things done for conservation. So let's uh, transition. I, I don't want to take much more of your time, but I wanted to talk about corridors a little bit. And I know that uh, in the discussion this week that we're going to discuss this topic and uh, Brandon is going to lead the discussions. So the corridors are really important because they're they're connecting patches, right? And there are lots of different kinds of corridors that could happen. Hopefully you can read uh, this area down here. But if you think about two, they're calling it core area here, but just think about it as patches that a species can live in. And then we've connected it right here. So the reason they're all in the same pattern here is we've basically <clears throat> lengthened, you know, we've, we've made a corridor between them that is passable to the species uh, or a continuous linkage between two core areas which has effectively made both of them accessible to the population, right? If we, we have other designs, like with birds, this is pretty common where you'll have like stepping stones like this, where we're increasing the connectivity between these two patches by having those stepping stones between them. Uh, another thing that we might do is take the stepping stones and actually connect each of those with a corridor. And we're effectively, in that case, we're just trying to reduce the resistance from moving from this patch to that patch, which increases species richness just by decreasing or uh, increasing immigration success. So in this area down here, though, another approach, essentially what we've done in this, in this case is not only uh, increase the, the uh, potential for a species to get from this patch to that one, but in this case, we've actually just created one big patch out of the two. So we connected those two with habitat and it just made effectively one really big one. So there's lots of different ways that we use these types of ideas uh, to do this kind of thing. But uh, here's another really cool map and it's basically measuring the corridor value for wildlife. And uh, as you can see, the fact that there's a whole bunch of brown in here, here I'll zoom in on it. The, you know, especially through the Corn Belt right here, a lot of the agricultural regions, I was showing you some of this uh, Mississippi alluvial valley here, uh, they're pretty poor corridor value. And that just means that wildlife can't get between habitat patches very well in that. Notice Florida here. There's one really good one, and I'm, uh, I know y'all are finding uh, corridor projects. This ought to give you some really good hints about where some of these are and help you, uh, help you think about where to find some of these things. I actually grew up in this black belt, and you can see the black belt sort of come out right here where uh, a lot of the, uh, the corridor value is still relatively good there, and uh, I'm not sure how much I agree with that, uh, but uh, definitely comes out. It's kind of interesting since I'm from there. So notice uh, I showed you the one in Florida. We've actually got a spine right here that's pretty good. And that actually is related to the Florida Wildlife Corridor Expedition or expedition. This is a map from the Florida Wildlife Corridor Expedition, uh, but this is the Florida Wildlife Corridor. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, done this expedition, but it's a pretty interesting thing. Uh, and here's showing you the route that uh, you can use. But uh, essentially, the idea is that we could take population, the panther population right here, and try to establish conservation uh, intact so that they would have a corridor to use all the way up to Alabama and to Georgia to these huge, uh, there's a huge protected area there. And the idea 
was particularly for the Florida panther, but also for black bear, it would connect populations and help with all the issues that arise in populations. So uh, there are lots of examples of this. Here, here's a jaguar corridor initiative. Uh, we've done a whole bunch of those ac across the landscape, and I hope that you're able to find a bunch of examples of this uh, on the landscape. But I wanted to go back to the farm bill things just for a, a minute so that you really understand this. So we're often targeting water areas to protect those, but that doesn't mean we can't get high quality wildlife habitat out of it, right? So uh, if we were going to design one here, we really want to focus on trying to make it wide and have any, enough uh, area that we can be really effective. Another thing, I think this makes a perfect example of it, a lot of the benefits that we're getting out of these buffers are, are uh, from beneficial insects like pollinators in the system. And pollinators are pretty limited. Here's a few uh, common examples right here of species and how far they can forage from their their uh, nesting uh, area and they're nesting in these natural communities so you can see that just a few different pollinators have very different amounts of space that they can cover while foraging so having buffers relatively close together could be pretty important to enhance uh, pollinator services and, and uh, ecosystem services, but also those pollinator populations to help facilitate uh, robust populations is pretty important for them to be able to get between patches. And that might vary widely just between species of, of bees, right? So uh, here I wanted to give you another visualization so you can see what I'm talking about. So if you imagine this this uh, cover here, we've got a couple of different agricultural things. If we were trying to establish corridors and these habitat patches through conservation programs, it might look something more like this, right? So we go from that to where we're establishing these things and now the landscape is really well connected, uh, much more so than it was before. And that really enhances things by reducing uh, the, the uh, distance but the effective distance between patches by making it easier to tra traverse the landscape. So uh, with that I'm going to go ahead and end here. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to it and hopefully you have a much better understanding for how island biogeography fits into our conservation and how to take that to working landscapes which you're almost certainly going to have to work in since we have modified much of the landscape and it's only going to you know we're only going to continue to increase that pressure with human activity so it's pretty important for us to understand those things uh, and think about them when we're in these systems so uh, looking forward to discussing this with you all thank you